chairman, lieutenant governor, mayors of the various cities. It is indeed a great privilege and honor for us to be back in the great city of Las Vegas. Very rarely do we go back a second time so quickly. Normally, we're not invited. <laughs> but we were invited to come back here, and in connection with that, I received a letter from Governor List suggesting that we add Reno. I don't know whether he thought that Reno needed it uh, extra or not, but anyway, we had a marvelous time in Reno last week. Uh, the only problem was the building was uh, not big enough to hold all the people because it was just packed out at every service. And uh, the response was the greatest per capita that we have ever seen in the United States in all these 30 years. And uh, so I feel that um, it was right that we go to Reno before coming here. Now I wanted to turn to a passage in the Bible just as a background for what I had to say. It's found in the first chapter of Isaiah, but I don't think I'll take time to read it all. At this particular moment in the history of Israel, or Judah, which was the southern part of Israel, they were very prosperous. And uh, religions were very popular in that day. But King Uzziah was a very popular king and a very good king of Judah. But ominous clouds were beginning to gather on the horizon. Now, we have the euphoria over uh, the change of administrations, and the country seemed to be almost uh, uh, unanimous uh, as far as a democracy can be uh, in changing uh, administrations in Washington. And we forget sometimes that those problems that President Carter has faced are going to be faced with the President Reagan administration. Inflation will still be here. The wars will still be going on. Hopefully and prayerfully, the hostages will have been released, but they may still be there. And uh, the newly elected President Reagan is going to face these gigantic problems and the terrible arms race that is going on in which the Soviets are building gigantic submarines as big as aircraft carriers, in which all of these things are taking place. And Mr. Reagan is going to need the prayers of people all over this country that God will give to him and his cabinet and his appointees wisdom as to how to handle these things. It may be the roughest period in the history of America since the Civil War that we're going to face in the next four or five years. I had a friend uh, fly uh, his jet star from Dallas to Reno to pick us up uh, night before last and bring us down here. And he had just come back from Europe and he just talked to the head uh, of a great bank in Europe. I won't call his name, but some of you would know him. And he has sent his children to America. He said, my wife and I are going to stay here, but we do not believe uh, that uh, we can go very much longer in this, in this country without revolution. He said, it's already taking place. And it's one of the great countries of Western Europe. And so many writers today and many people are beginning to say, that something is about to happen, something is about to give. And uh, Isaiah the prophet warned of a coming judgment. And he said, your religious pretenses are not enough for God. He said, wash you, make you clean, and put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil and learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fathers and plead for the widows. And then he used President Johnson's favorite text. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He says, come and repent of your sins. Turn to God and God will forgive you. Then he said, but if you refuse, if you rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. I think present day events parallel those of Isaiah's day because we're witnesses of social, political, intellectual, and spiritual convulsions all over the world. I'm thinking about the Khomeini. Who would have thought two years ago that the Shah would be off the throne and Khomeini would be sitting on whatever throne he calls that throne? Uh, I was in Oxford this year and in Cambridge. I held a 10-day uh, mission at Cambridge University and uh, a week at Oxford University. 
And uh, one of the great sociologists at Oxford told me that in sociology at Oxford, they consider 60, the 60s to have been what they call the restless and revolting decade. The 70s, they call the me decade, where we're interested in getting things for ourselves. But the 80s, he said, we're calling the survival decade. Will we survive the 80s? Because things are happening so rapidly. The tempo of the times is speeded up. And we've heard the voices of the diplomats and the educators and even the political leaders. And now we are faced with many, many problems. And yesterday the Supreme Court ruled five to four that we can't even hang the Ten Commandments in our schoolrooms. And our young people are morally rudderless. They don't know what's right and what's wrong. And yet they're longing to know what's right and wrong. They want somebody to tell them what's right and wrong. And we felt that the Ten Commandments which uh, Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish alike could all agree on might be something you could at least hang in the schoolroom if you couldn't have prayer. But now that has been ruled as unconstitutional. But Sir Winston Churchill once said, our problems are beyond us. A foreign correspondent in London said the other day, we're living in a night of total crisis. And I find a frantic search on the part of people all over the world for some answers. You know, we have um, the media communication, instant communication, and the world has become a neighborhood without becoming a brotherhood. And we have cultures clashing against cultures, ethnic groups against ethnic groups. All, anything that happens in Uganda makes headlines today. We didn't even know Uganda existed 50 years ago. And things that happened in those parts of the world didn't affect us 50 years ago. Today, any little blow up anywhere in the world affects us. And one writer wrote the other day, I cannot find my way, there is no star. And it seems that we've missed it somewhere. We took the wrong road somewhere. And we can blame this party or that party or this political leader or that political leader. But I think we as a people have missed it somewhere. I think we've gone after things and materialism. And our young people have been revolting and saying, no, this is not what we want. There's something deeper in life. And you go to the average university today and you'll find a tremendous interest in spiritual things at the university. I used to go to universities just a few years ago and there'd be cat calls or maybe an egg thrown or something else. Uh, today, they sit and listen. Absolutely, you can hear a pin drop. I was at the University of Illinois in January and that great place was filled with 18,000 students. And I, after the speech I gave, uh, uh, had a question and answer period. And, and you couldn't believe that about seven or 8,000 stayed for the question and answer period. They had to write them out because there's no way to carry microphones to everybody and get them up to the platform. And then I went to Oxford and the same thing happened there. They had five buildings all with closed circuit television at Oxford. And uh, I'd just broken three ribs the night before I arrived and the doctor said, you can't stand up and speak. You'll have to sit in a chair. I said, doctor, I'll have to. He said, the pain will kill you. And he said, I can't give you painkillers because it'll affect your mind. Well, I said, my mind's already affected. But, <laughs> but uh, then we went, uh, had a couple days off, and I went to Harley Street in London and got them retaped up, and then went to Cambridge in 10 days and saw three buildings with closed circuit. And they wouldn't let anybody in except students or members of the faculty at Great St. Mary's, the great, the largest auditorium there. And uh, to see those students as they came and they listened, not one single outburst, not one single problem, except the last night somebody threw a stink bomb. And I was disappointed we didn't have it every night, because I expect when I go to some places like that you'd have it. But no longer. They're listening. And young people today are, are disturbed by what they hear and what they read. And many of them are quite frightened, to be frank with you. A European leader was quoted in the New York Times the other day as saying, if the devil offers a panacea for the problems of the world, I'll follow the devil. Well, I expect the devil is offering it. And maybe we are following the wrong leader today. Long ago, Job said, oh, that I knew where I might find him. And many people are trying to escape. Many people come to Las Vegas from the east trying to escape. And if they can't find it here, they go to San Francisco trying to find it. And then if they can't find it there, they jump off the bridge. And uh, so the further west you come, uh, the higher the suicide rate is. Because people have started out east and they, they feel if they could only travel, if they could go somewhere else, 
they might find what they're seeking. What they're really seeking is God. It's like acres of diamonds. It's in your own backyard. It's right in the Bible, right here. All you have to do is turn to it and start reading and studying, and you can find God for yourself. And, uh, you know, many people come here, they're, they're losers when they get here. They've already lost in their own hearts and lives. And they're intent upon self-forgetfulness and people fleeing from themselves to become lost in the crowd. And, you know, it's interesting to me when I watch television that the heroes of of most of our films today seems to be spiritually homeless people. And a number of magazine articles are coming out about well-known people and their psychological and temperamental problems. Jeremiah the prophet said, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out broken cisterns. What's wrong? It's like the old story that I told many years ago about the man that went to the doctor. And the doctor examined him, and uh, finally he said, well, how long have you had this problem? He said, well, I had it about three years ago, and then about six years ago I had it the first time. And the doctor couldn't figure out at all what he had, so he said, well, you've got it again. <laughs> and uh, it seems that every generation must fight it out. This was to be the Christian century. There was a magazine started in 1900 called the Christian Century. The 20th century was to be the century of peace, the Christian century. But uh, by 1914, things had blown up and we had World War I and then a few years elapsed and we had World War II. And now the vice premier of China, Premier Deng, said the other day that war is inevitable in the decade of the 80s, and he said it's independent of man's will. He said there's nothing man will be able to do about it. Well, I think that is wrong. There is something we can do about it. I think if our first priority is spiritual, if we turn to God, and without him, we could have the next world war. You see, human nature is wrong side up. I heard about uh, some young people that were working on a puzzle, and on one side was a jigsaw puzzle. One side was a man that they were supposed to uh, try to put together. The other side was the world. So they finally decided that the man was easiest, and they said, if we'll put the man right, we'll have the world right. And that's exactly what we need today. Man needs to be right, then the world will be right. Your world would be right if you were right with God. You have no idea the fulfillment and the joy and the peace in this life that you can have when you know Jesus Christ. And what you have to do is very, very simple. I've never understood why people missed it because it is so very simple what you have to do. By faith, turn to Christ. Let him come into your heart. And it's a very simple thing. It's so simple that most people stumble over it because we want somebody to tell us to do something hard. I've come, I've preached all over the parts of the world where people are told to do something hard, to earn forgiveness, to earn atonement with God, to earn all of this, because the whole world is religious. The greatest religious country in the world today, I suppose, is India. And all over the world, people have religions. That's one of the problems in the world, religion clashing against religion. The great revival of Islam that's going on. In some parts of the world, Buddhism reviving. And they're bringing Confucianism back into China. All of these things are happening at the same time that the world is politically in an upheaval. And it seems to be all confused and mixed up. But for you, it can be straightened out. For you personally. Because whatever the circumstances, I read about a, a couple that lost their home in the fire in California. And it was in the paper, I think, yesterday. And they said, well, we still have each other and we have the Lord. And while they interviewed some that were crying, these people had happiness on their face. Now, maybe they didn't like where they lived anyway. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, they, they said, because we have God, we can cope. And that is true. There's a little song that goes, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And Jesus Christ is alive. He can come into your heart and change your life. And because he lives in your heart, you can face the problems and the circumstances of tomorrow. Now, I know that there are quite a number of executives here, and I heard one when I, I, spoke, I spoke to the Young Presidents Clubs in Acapulco last winter, and 
uh, I heard this story about a young president of an East Coast corporation. And he instructed his secretary not to disturb him because he had a very important appointment. But the chairman of the board of his company came and asked to see him. And the secretary said, I'm sorry, I cannot disturb him. Uh, he has a special appointment. And the chairman got angry and he banged open the door and looked and he saw the president of his company on his knees in prayer. And the chairman went back into the secretary's room and said, is this usual? She said, yes, sir, every morning. The chairman said, no wonder. I have to come to him for advice. <laughs> and I want to tell you, if you put God first in your life, you will have the advice and the counsel and the direction you need in your personal life but you'll also be able to convey it to others around you. Thank you and God bless you.